Well, we're going to uh, start right now at the top of the hour. Thank you, everyone, for joining us for our monthly lunchtime webinar. If you haven't yet set up your audio, please go to Tools, select Audio, and then Audio Setup. Uh, my name is Carla Wool, and I will be your moderator today. The idea behind these webinars is to open up the classroom to our alumni and friends to give you the opportunity to hear the latest research and thinking on critical public health issues. We very much want this to be a dialogue, so this will be a 30-minute lecture followed by questions and discussion. Let me give you a brief tour of the Illuminate program that we're using. In the middle of the left-hand portion of the screen is a text box. That's where you can type questions, either as they occur to you during the lecture or during the question and answer part of the webinar. You also see a number of emoticons. Feel free to use these and give us feedback throughout the lecture. Our lecturer today is Dr. Hilary Godwin. She is a professor in the Environmental Health Sciences Department, Associate Dean for Academic Programs, and Faculty Director of the school's new Global Bio Lab. This state-of-the-art facility for the automated analysis of infectious disease samples will vastly increase the rate at which infectious agents are submitted, tested, and analyzed. In this webinar, Dr. Godwin will give you a look inside the lab and discuss opportunities for collaboration with the infectious disease and public health communities. So let's get started. Hillary? Hi. Can everybody hear me? <laughs> okay, I got a smiley face. Good. Okay. Um, let me go ahead and forward to the first slide. Um, thank you all for joining us today. Um, I'm going to try and give you an overview, as, as Carla said, about the new Global Bio Lab and also talk about some of the opportunities that it's um, providing us both for training and collaboration um, in infectious disease research. The first thing that I wanted to do was to acknowledge the many people who have contributed to um, the Global Bio Lab, both in terms of getting it set up and then building the infrastructure needed to um, partner with people to be able to do research in the facility. Um, the funding for the facility came from um, primarily two different sources, the first being um, a congressional line item. Um, that went through the Defense Threat Reduction Agency. Um, and uh, we owe a huge debt of gratitude to um, Linda Rosenstock and Cindy Horn, um, who um, participated in um, obtaining that, that congressional line item, and obviously to our um, supporters on Capitol Hill who um, were able to have it go through. Um, in addition, there is funding that was received from um, the Department uh, the, sorry, the California Office of Homeland Security, which is now under Cal EMA, um, uh, for funding for um, upgrading the facility and also purchasing the uh, instrumentation that's in the facility, and we're um, very much in debt to them as well. The original vision for the facility came from uh, Professor Scott Lane, um, who was on the faculty uh, of UCLA at the time, and Tony Bugelsdyke, who um, at the time was uh, 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 scientist working at Los Alamos National Lab um, who came up with the concept of the lab and uh, the original design of it. Um, currently, myself and Jeff Meller, who's the chair of microbiology, immunology, and molecular genetics at UCLA, uh, are the two faculty directors. And we have an extensive staff for the facility led by Lee Borenstein, who came to us from the LA County um, uh, Public Health Laboratory. At, who serves as our laboratory director, and Robin Fox, who serves as our administrative director for the facility. In addition to a number of students uh, in the School of Public Health who have been working um, on helping us to set up the facility, and um, extensive collaborations with Los Alamos National Laboratory, and a very strong team there who are involved in um, design of the automated systems that I'm going to be telling you about, and um, then validating the systems once they're purchased from um, systems integrators um, prior to them being shipped to, to UCLA for use. In addition, uh, I wanted to also acknowledge that we have an absolutely fabulous scientific advisory board for the Global Bio Lab. Um, you'll recognize, I'm sure, some of the names of the people on this list who have been um, 
very giving with their time in terms of providing us with um, advice on the project. And an extensive executive committee mainly made up of faculty um, across UCLA in infectious diseases. And I will tell you a little bit about some of the work that um, Anne Ramoyne has done and also some work from Tom Smith's lab that particularly um, are the type of research that we're hoping to enable through this facility. Um, but I wanted to also um, thank the rest of the executive committee who's, who have been integral in terms of us getting this facility up and running. So the concept for the Global Bio Lab was really to create um, a laboratory that would allow for a completely new approach to infectious disease research. So the motivation was that we wanted to be able to connect the factors that link um, emergence, transmission, virulence, and progression in infectious diseases. And that in order to be able to do that, we really needed to have a much richer um, and more complex set of data that included environmental data, um, and epidemiological data, as well as phenotypic data and genomic data, all that was um, well annotated with appropriate metadata and linked together in the same computing system um, so that we could connect all these different factors and then start to um, understand how they contributed to um, the, uh, the infectious disease, as I said, emergence um, transmission. Um, and progression. So um, the, the core concept behind how we would be able to have a rich enough, well annotated data set that contained all these different pieces um, was the idea of creating a high throughput um, laboratory that was, had the capability of rapidly analyzing thousands of surveillance samples collected from different infectious disease hotspots across the globe. Um, and that the the analysis would allow us to identify emerging and re-emerging pathogens, detect pandemics before they become difficult to contain, and also to biobank or archive collections of uh, unique infectious disease samples for future analysis. And I'll give you some examples, for instance, from Anne Ramoyne's uh, work where she has really um, unparalleled uh, collection system built up in the Democratic Republic of the Congo and, um, and samples that really no one else in the world has access to. And so being able to have those stored in biobank for future retrospective studies um, is incredibly important. Um, And again, the idea of having this an enabling technology is that it would allow for us to conduct um, cutting edge science on how viral and bacterial pathogens evolve in the dynamics of complex populations and also speed the development of new therapeutics and vaccines. Uh, conceptually, um, the Global Biolab um, is a facility, uh, a biocontainment facility that contains these automated systems. So unique in the sense that it allows for handling of um, up to biosafety level three um, pathogens um, and select agents. So it's engineered to be able to handle those. Um, and that the systems are connected to each other through not just a a laboratory information management system, but also a more extensive IT system, which I'll describe to you, that allows for um, field data um, that's acquired on handheld devices um, and da epidemiological data collected in the field to be integrated in with the data um, that's collected on the individual automated systems and uh, collected through the limb system and then um, able to be visualized um, by the collaborators and researchers who are making use of the facility. Uh, currently, we're um, uh, certified to be able to work at biosafety level two and obviously we're in the process of um, ramping up so that we'll be able to handle um, biosafety level three agents. So in terms of the types of automated systems that were designed for the facility, um, after we have samples coming in and are, are manually unpacked, 
Um, there's an accessioning system which allows for the samples to be um, aliquoted from the type of tubes where they're collected in the field into um, much smaller um, custom um, tubes that are specific for the different types of automation and allow us for us to do multiple different types of analyses on any given sample um, and also to biobank a, a set of the sample as well. Um, the next system is a biobanking or archiving system and I'm going to walk you through each of the, these different systems that we have in place already to give you some details about them um, that allows for automated um, retrieval of specific samples. The next system um, where most samples would go would be to an extraction and screening system which uh, we currently have a purchase order out for um, to a systems integrator who's working on developing that system and we expect to have delivery of that by the end of this calendar year. Um, and then potentially to um, other processes, for instance, um, one of the systems that I'll sh show you a little bit more detail about is a, a gene prep system to prepare samples that come up positive from the screen or from other, or known to be positives to prep those for um, Sanger sequencing. Um, and you can imagine that we also um, will be building in capabilities, for instance, for um, being able to do culturing as well. So those are future plans. Okay, so I wanted to sort of give you an idea of the type of sample streams that we're envisioning coming into here. And one of our primary collaborators in this endeavor and a member of our executive committee is Professor Tom Smith, who's a professor both in our Institute of Environment and Sustainability and also Ecology and Evolutionary Biology. And uh, importantly for us, the director of the Center for Tropical Research at UCLA. And <clears throat> the mission of the Center for Tropical Research is really to understand the biotic processes that underline and maintain the diversity of life worldwide, especially in the tropics and use it to address global environmental challenges. But within that realm, um, Professor Smith actually specifically works on infectious disease ecology himself. And, <clears throat> excuse me, and uh, has just been a wonderful um, collaborator for us in terms of um, tying in with 25 years worth of field experience um, in biosurveillance of infectious diseases. One of the exciting opportunities that we have through this collaboration is that the Center for Tropical Research has been building this worldwide pipeline of biological samples and uh, are very eager to um, have those samples come into the Global Bio Lab for as um, both uh, biobanking and also um, screening. The other opportunity that we have through this collaboration is that the Center for Tropical Research has established um, international research and training centers in specific um, countries in the developing world, specifically where there are infectious disease hotspots because Tom is the director of that facility. And so uh, there I see a really fabulous opportunity not just for us to um, be obtaining samples but also to provide training opportunities for our students to be uh, doing international internships going to those countries, um, working either in this arena um, if infectious diseases or other projects that are um, of interest to the home countries in which the, the training centers are, are uh, situated. Um, one example being Cameroon, which I'll talk about in just a second. And, um, and also for us in the School of Public Health to use those as launching pads for uh, capacity building in these areas where we know um, that there's um, infectious disease emergence. So um, it specifically, the projects that Tom has been doing for the last 25 years in Central Africa, mainly out of this IRTC in Cameroon, um, include um, malaria surveillance projects and also um, influenza surveillance. And he already has, for instance, a, a Fogarty supported program to train um, Cameroonian um, scientists in how to do infectious disease ecology and surveillance. Um, 
So that's just to give you a sense of the, the type of sample streams that we anticipate will be coming into the facility and the type of collaborations that we set up. One of the enabling technologies that we're able to offer the field researchers is a, a handheld surveillance device um, which is used for the collection of the metadata and epidemiological data that then gets paired with the laboratory data that we have um, coming in from the Global Bio Lab. Um, th those samples then and their paired data that's coming from those handheld devices come in through an unpacking facility within the Global Bio Lab um, and then go into um, the accessioning system, which is what I'm going to show you next. So um, this is to give you a sense of if you look at the bottom picture, um, this is the automated accessioning system. Um, when it was being validated under uh, BSL-2 conditions at Los Alamos National Laboratory. And you can get a better sense of the automation. Um, it uh, allows for us to have researchers send in either two or five mil cryotubes and then aliquots those tubes out into um, individual um, 0.3 um, milliliter tubes or 300 microliter tubes um, and which are then individually sealed so that they can be moved around the laboratory as an individual containment unit. Um, to be able to work with um, BSL-3 agents in the facility and to minimize potential for exposure and aerosolization, um, we have now, if you look at the top two pictures, within our facility, once we moved it here, placed that entire automated system within um, what's basically a biosafety cabinet um, or a biocell that provides containment um, of the automation. Um, so that gives us a, a dual level of protection. You can see here um, our laboratory director, Lee, and the pro project manager from Los Alamos, Tracy Erkla, um, looking at the system, they're working in shirt sleeves because right now um, there's no infectious agents um, on that particular system. Uh, but you can imagine that when we get to the point of using infectious agents, now we have an opportunity of having a really nice engineering control on top of the personal protective equipment that they would be using for running samples in this facility and on that instrument the automated system. The next step for a sample um, would most likely be to go into our biobanking or archiving system. And here um, we're actually quite fortunate in that um, Hamilton, which is a company um, uh, that's located on the east coast of the United States, has developed um, an automated storage and retrieval system that operates at minus 80 degrees. This just came out onto the market. We have one of the first units. Um, it's completely robotically controlled. Um, it allows us to integrate the system with our laboratory information management system and also allows us to do all sorts of reporting um, and tracking the history of different samples. And importantly for the type of samples that we're working with, um, allows us to um, provide um, security measures in terms of access rights to different um, samples within the system. Uh, for those of you who are interested in sort of the technical details, um, what's nice about the system is that it's similar to a standard minus 80 Revco system, um, but has using a magnetically controlled robotics coming up through the bottom, the ability to place samples into racks um, within the freezer system. And um, one of the nicest functions of it is that it actually has a picking and um, sample, what's called punching, um, um, function that allows us to identify specific samples by either the 1D barcode on the individual tubes. Those, each of those 300 milliliter tubes have their own uh, unique barcode and or the barcode for the entire plate that the tube is sitting in and to create new plates that contain just those samples that we're interested in um, looking at for further analysis. So it allows really good inventory control um, that is, I think, going to really help in terms of um, throughput in this facility. The next system that I wanted to show you is the Gina Prep system, um, which again is also here already at UCLA, and we're in the process of going through um, the, val the final validation of. Um, this system is a system that once you have um, samples that have already been uh, had the 
um, RNA or DNA extracted. This allows us to do the PCR amplification that's required for Sanger sequencing and preps the samples so that they're all ready to go into um, uh, uh, Sanger sequencers, which are located within the facility. Um, one question that people might have is why we chose to go with um, Sanger sequencing technology as opposed to next generation or thir even third generation sequencing. And uh, the primary reason for that is because of the um, four um, the type of applications that we're envisioning for this system that we needed to have the um, high quality data that you get from Sanger sequencing and which really um, hasn't been achieved yet from um, next generation sequencing. That being said, there are other types of applications obviously in infectious disease work where next generation sequencing is proving incredibly powerful and we're also working with our infectious disease community to set up a pathway to allow for samples to be prepped within this facility and once they're no longer infectious then shipped out to external facilities for next generation sequencing. Okay. Um, that Next thing that I wanted to talk about, which I think is one of our key attributes, is the data analysis um, um, functionality within the laboratory. So um, one of the core concepts of this laboratory, again, is not just that there would be a LIMS system, but that there would be an integrated system where our collaborators and clients would be able to deliver electronically their data that they're collecting in the field. Um, from a variety of different sources that we have that integrated with our LIMS system for um, generating data within the laboratory and that all of that is then also integrated with the system that's used for data analysis whether it's modeling or simulations or bioinformatics and that there's a easy to use portal um, that our collaborators and clients can use to access that information at the end. Um, conceptually, the way that this is set up is that we have um, functionalities that are uh, unique to UCLA that are part of our LIMS system, which here is shown within this um, beige box and the sub boxes within there, um, which would, uh, which most people who are, have a complicated um, laboratory setup where you have a LIMS system would be fairly um, familiar with this type of integration. The challenge within this environment in terms of um, integration with the laboratory information management system is that on top of integrating individual pieces of instrumentation the way you would in a normal laboratory, we actually have automated systems which are themselves um, made up of integration of many different pieces of uh, equipment and we uh, have worked very closely with the systems integrators that are providing those automated systems to make sure that the um, technology that they're developing and the web systems that they're developing in order to control all the pieces of instrumentation within an individual automated system also allows for that integrated system to communicate back to our LIMS system. So uh, a really important concept within this laboratory has been um, defining um, a consistent set of specifications for information technology for all of the automated systems to ensure that they will, we will be able to integrate them um, all together into one system. And then in addition, also making sure that we have mechanisms for integrating the other types of information coming into the laboratory, good example being uh, data from, for instance, those handheld devices that I showed you, and also being able to export um, data that um, for processing into uh, a mode that can be accessed by uh, researchers. Um, so here I just a little more detail on the laboratory information management system. Um, again, those of you who are familiar with LIMS systems, this is not going to come as any surprise. I would say the major challenge here has been the integration of the automated systems. Um, and this is just to give conceptually for those of you who are interested in the in IT side of things, um, how we've managed to do that. As I mentioned, the sort of core concept of the laboratory is this idea of having well-defined um, specifications for web services that allow for um, the LIMS system to in 
talk to and integrate with those automated, individual automated systems, which then themselves are comprised of many different pieces of instrumentation. Um, in terms of data integration and visualization, again, I think um, this is an important core concept, which is that the data integration and visualization be integrated within the system that also comprises the LIMS system. Um, and the idea was that it should be able to support various data sources and also be, um, to the greatest extent possible, plug and play in the sense that we're not reinventing um, new modes for data visualization, but rather integrating them within an existing system. Um, and, and again, uh, uh, emphasis on um, it being as easy as possible for the user to be able to access all of their information coming out of the system um, through this one portal. Um, Another thing that I wanted to emphasize um, that's a core concept behind this is that we um, do have a backup system. Um, so we have a replication site um, off campus um, that, al that allows us to have a complete backup. Um, that's important for two reasons. One is sort of the standard reason that you always want to have a complete backup of your system. Um, the other core part of this is that this is really a demonstration project where um, we see this as the f a laboratory that needs that would be networked not only to other high throughput screening laboratories in the future, but hopefully also to um, other collaborators as well. And so building the infrastructure for the replication site allows us to build in those modules that are necessary for communication, secure communication with external clients as well. Okay, so why is this um, groundbreaking? So I just wanted to come back again to some of the work that's been going on um, already in the School of Public Health um, in Andrew Moyne's lab in collaboration with the Center for Tropical Research, where they've really been able to take um, surveillance data that they've been collecting in the field and link that to environmental data in a way that allows them to look at um, how environmental variables and climatic data um, give you information about um, disease distribution, um, hosts, vectors, et cetera. So here I just wanted to highlight um, some recent um, papers that have come out of Anne Ramoyne's group. Um, again, as I mentioned earlier, Anne Ramoyne has built up an incredible infrastructure within the Democratic Republic of the Congo working with in-country uh, researchers and with their um, public health um, agency to be able to do surveillance that just is completely unprecedented and through those efforts has been able to collect samples um, that has demonstrated that the incidence of human monkeypox um, since the smallpox vaccination campaign ceased about 30 years ago has increased dramatically. Um, and furthermore, through the combination of the work that she's done in terms of surveillance and also remote sensing data, um, she and the people in the Center for Tropical Research have been able to pinpoint um, the likely reservoir for monkeypox within the Congo, something that hadn't been known previously. So as I mentioned, the capacity um, to be able to, um, first of all, provide Annie with the opportunity to have those samples um, archived um, and under her control here at UCLA is, is really important to us, but also enabling um, these very interdisciplinary types of studies um, that combine not only different areas of public health, but also basic field ecology um, and biology with public health is really critical and I think a really exciting opportunity for us. Okay, so at that point I just wanted to stop and um, answer any questions that people might have. So at this point, I'm hoping that people will yeah, send yeah, in questions. I'm going to come back have. on for a second Carly, while people are I'm thinking okay. about questions to type in. Maybe okay. you could talk about um, the type of new science that, that you envision uh, this lab enabling here at UCLA. Yeah, so, um, the, yeah, so um, the examples that I gave you, I think, are um, of Anne Ramoyne's work and the flu surveillance work that Tom Smith is doing in Cameroon. Um, 
and other parts of Africa are perfect examples of where um, we have researchers who are who have spent years, if not decades, in countries building up infrastructure to be able to collect really unique set of samples. And uh, the ability to help them with getting those samples um, into the United States get them archived so that they're available for future studies, and also screen them in a high throughput mode to look for um, disease prevalence, I think is just fabulous. We're very excited about that. The other thing that, that we have been doing is um, working with our broader infectious disease community to identify where there are opportunities that or things that maybe we hadn't anticipated when the facility was being designed, but now could be enabled by the type of um, capacity that we have. And so um, examples of that include how, um, for instance, we have a very, very strong group of HIV researchers on campus. Um, many of the people who are on the call are probably familiar with uh, Roger Deedles, um, who's in the School of Public Health. Um, who works in this area, but we also have um, clinicians who are working in HIV and also um, a lot of bench scientists working in this area. And they have some exciting ideas about how, for instance, we might be able to use this facility to um, process uh, large numbers of samples um, to look at, for instance, composition of HIV strains within an in individual who's affected infected and looking at how different interventions might impact that swarm of, um, of virus within the individual. So again, like, uh, although this might not have been something that we even would have conceived of at the time that the facility was originally designed, um, it's an exciting new opportunity that's enabled not only by um, next generation and third generation sequencing, but also by our ability to be able to process large numbers of samples and look at a population basis at what's going on. OK, so I have a question that just came up from Dick Jackson asking, how does this work interact with the California Department of Public Health in their labs? Um, and I did not address that. He said, I joined a bit late, so if you covered, please ignore this question. But I did not address that. Um, so. Um, one of the things um, that's very important to us in this facility is to be able to serve not just as a basic research laboratory, but also as a resource for the region and for the country. Um, and so that was a uh, primary part of our motivation for recruiting Ed Lee Borenstein, who's our uh, laboratory director who came from LA County Department of Public Health in terms of building re productive relationships with um, the California Department of Public Health and the nor local public health laboratories. Um, I should also say um, Sydney Harvey has been incredibly helpful in this regard as well. She runs a laboratory director training program um, at UCLA, and so her connectivity um, and the students that she's training, I think, also will provide us not only with current connections to um, public health labs within the state of California, but also allow us to, to participate in training for the next generation of leaders in the facility. Um, in terms of practicalities of working with um, either local public health laboratories, the state laboratory, or um, national, uh, nationally with the lab response network, um, there's a couple of um, different scenarios that we have in mind. So um, currently, um, we're, we're not in the immediate time frame going to be um, CLIA licensed. So um, we would not be doing diagnostic work for <clears throat> that would be reportable on individual patients, but rather participating in um, work that was giving um, surveillance information uh, or, or sort of a population-wide um, response. So one of the ways that I see that we can uh, offer assistance to the state in sort of a, a more immediate time frame is the um, genotyping, genoprep system, where uh, we do have the capacity to look at samples um, that are be being collected through the infectious disease surveillance program at the state or federal level and uh, get more in-depth um, genomic 
um, full genome sequencing data to report back to them. So that's one way that we would like to participate. Um, and we do currently have a collaboration with the Centers for Disease Control to um, use some um, archive samples that they have to validate our instrumentation. Um, and, then um, and then for um, specific collaborations on projects, um, again, I think it's really going to come down to us developing those relationships with um, individuals at the county and state uh, laboratories to make sure that um, we're not only um, helping them to meet their training needs, which is sort of our immediate time frame, um, but also building in the capacity to provide backup for them as um, is needed in future um, Hillary, epidemics. you touched on it a little bit during the webinar, um, but perhaps you could talk more about the unique training opportunities that the lab will provide for students. Yeah. <coughs> so again, um, I think if you had to define sort of what is absolutely unique about this facility, it's the confluence of having a high containment facility with having the automated systems. And uh, although um, many of the public health laboratories within the state of California um, are taking advantage of um, automated sample analyses, they tend um, to be systems where it's um, an individual piece of instrumentation that's been designed to do a specific task as opposed to these large integrated automated systems that we have within the facility. So. Um, in addition to the direct training of people who are in the public health laboratory director training program, um, I see a, a, just a great opportunity for us to reach out to um, a broader spectrum of people within the public health laboratory community and provide training um, in these um, more complex automated systems that might not be accessible otherwise. Um, it's also a great opportunity for our own students, even if they weren't planning on going on to work in a, in a, a county laboratory, um, to be able to be involved in infectious disease research and really see um, and, and be involved in projects that involve um, integration of data from so many different sources and really um, link the complexities of the field epidemiology that our collaborators are doing to really state-of-the-art um, analytical capabilities. Anyone have any questions? They can just type them in the text box uh, on the left-hand portion of the screen. And, and, and while we wait for you to do that, Hillary, also it provides some opportunities for the university itself if you can address that. Yeah, so um, within the university, again, I, at the beginning I pointed out um, this extensive executive committee that we have that really um, includes representation from a, a wide range of infectious disease expertise across campus. And uh, we're really seeing it as um, an institutional research to uh, resource to help launch new um, initiatives, again, um, really focused on sort of population level, um, looking at large sets of um, samples. Um, in a way that couldn't be done um, easily or at all um, using a traditional um, bench lab approach. So uh, it's been, we've been actually having a lot of fun this year um, getting together our executive committee and doing brainstorming sessions about what new types of science um, would be enabled by this. And I think um, have really built up a lot of excitement within that group of ideas for different program project grants that we'd like to uh, apply for um, to be able to um, take advantage of the facility. Um, I gave the one example of sort of doing swarm analysis within HIV, but another area um, that's important to a number of people at UCLA is we actually have another um, high throughput screening laboratory um, on campus that can handle up to BSL-2 agents that's used extensively by researchers across campus for translational research to screen, for instance, for um, 
new therapeutic agents to target specific um, infectious diseases. And uh, there's been so much success with that facility that there's a big um, push for us to be able to expand that capability into handling um, more virulent pathogens, um, and which would be enabled through this facility. So that's another area where um, there's a huge demand, and it again is a fairly unique combination of having the automated systems within a high-level containment facility. Well, nobody's typing in questions there. I'll give you one last chance. Um, if you have any question, it's a good opportunity to ask Hillary about the lab. Uh, if not, um, Hillary, thank you so much uh, for that lecture, um, and thank everybody for participating. Um, this lunchtime webinar will continue next month um, on April 13th with Dr. E. Richard Brown, who is the director of the Center for Health Policy Research. He's going to be talking about putting data and analysis to work in public health policy making. Uh, we hope you all can join us then. And again, thank you, Hillary, and thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.